I was reminded that, yes, this is the 60th anniversary for both PPS and uh, uh, <coughs> Preserve Rhode Island. And, um, uh, but one of the things that hasn't been said is that uh, the, the instigator behind all of that was John Nicholas Brown. Uh, who was instrumental in, in founding both of these organizations uh, at the same time, one local and one statewide. Uh, and both of them now have been thriving for 60 years. So uh, I just thought it was worth taking a minute to, to remember Mr. Brown and what, what he did um, and helped us to get where we are today. Uh, tonight I'm going to do sort of, uh, I think it's 1840 to 1890 or so. Uh, if you, if you look at the actual schedule or list of lectures, you'll see that they actually overlap somewhat. It's, it's hard to sort of cut off and say, you know, we, we're going to stop right at this date. So uh, I'll slide a little beyond 1890 today, and I'll probably start a little bit before next week when we, when we finish up and go from, from 1890 to 1940. Uh, but this, this <coughs> series, which gets harder and harder to do every week, um, <coughs> because um, there is more and more built uh, in each of these periods. So that, you know, when we're talking about a period from 1770 to 1810 or 1820, you know, there are, there's, there's, there are not that many buildings compared to what, there, what followed. Um, there are not as many images of those buildings. But once we get into the 19th century, there are many, many more buildings of all different kinds, <coughs> and with the proliferation of, of engraving and particularly of photography, uh, there are just so many different images that you could, um, I could probably just click through these for an hour and, and go through three or four hundred images just uh, in order, um, because there, there's, there's so much to see and look at. So uh, it becomes more and more of a, of a uh, an effort to, to edit these and uh, um, uh, try to make some, some sense out of it f for you as well, as for me first and, and then for you. Um, uh, I'll start off here um, with, with images that uh, uh, sort of are bracketing this period from roughly 1840, 1850 to around 1890. Uh, and this is what was built as the Providence Institution for Savings. I, I showed this last week, so this, this is a, should be a familiar image of the original building uh, uh, by uh, Charles G. Hall uh, from around 1854 or so. Uh, and that's what's incorporated into the north section uh, of the Old Stone Bank uh, building by Stone Carpenter and Wilson from 1896-98. Um, and more about that later, but this, this just sort of brackets the period uh, we're talking about. Um, this gives you an, an idea, and I, I think I may have used this before as well, but I, I, I like repeating these because uh, I, I, I think particularly with strong images, and I think this is one, uh, they, they really bear repeating. Um, this is Market Square, and about the only thing um, left uh, is the Market House. Uh, in the same location. This is where the RISD Auditorium is. This is where the, um, what used to be the Hospital Trust uh, Bank, now RISD Dormitories, is located. Um, but there, the thing that also remains to a, to a degree is the same spatial configuration. The RISD Auditorium occupies pretty much the footprint of this group of buildings over here. So you do have the same sort of spatial relationship between Market House and this, this open space, which fortunately is still preserved today. How wide is the bridge? Here's the fence uh, along the river itself. It probably is not a whole lot different from what it is today. Um, that, um, because this is, is really right at the, the heart of some of the most dense development um, in, the, in the middle of Providence. So this, this area has been heavily built up. I mean, oops. I mean, while, you know, while there's a, a much bigger building here today, uh, the, the, the footprint of buildings on the ground is pretty much the same there. So that this, the, uh, while it, it feels different because of the scale of the, of the buildings, 
both here and, and here, um, the footprints on the ground in the open space between um, these, these spaces is really not much changed from when this image was created around 1835, I want to say. Um, uh, one of the, the uh, buildings right in that area is the uh, Arnold Hoffman building from around 1848, built as a warehouse on, uh, uh, on uh, uh, Canal Street. Uh, you see here the, 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 the river right in, in front of it. Um, uh, a very typical uh, 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 somewhat, well, not, I don't want to say pedestrian, but a very simple uh, utilitarian sort of building. Uh, five stories high, built, to, to, uh, built basically as a warehouse uh, when this area along here uh, had more of an active waterfront so that warehouses were actually interacting with the water more um, in that location at that time. Um, here we see, we, I think we, we've looked at this before, this is, this is the major um, uh, building project in, in uh, uh, in central Providence in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, and we could really devote a whole evening to this area ar around here, um, exp extend, expend, extending a little west and a little south, uh, because this is one of the most heavily reconfigured areas in the city of Providence. Uh, this is what we know as Kennedy Plaza today, the, the old train station, which you see here, Thomas Teff's design, built between 1846 and 48 uh, at the south side of the cove. And you can see the tracks coming in from the west, s slipping around the, the cove basin, and then heading up uh, north. Uh, this, this rail alignment here and here is really not that much changed. It's just that the station just kept moving back and back and back uh, until now it's at the foot of the State House lawn. Um, but you have to keep in mind, if you just to think about it spatially, this block right here is where Providence City Hall is today. So you can see that that um, station was right across the street. Um, from Union Station, and we'll see an image a little bit later that will give you an even um, better better sense of that. What year was that taken down? The station um, it burned in 1896. Um, it was it was planned to be replaced. Um, the, the city had been talking about uh, uh, moving the railroad tracks. Uh, it, that's a favorite topic in Providence. Let's move the railroad tracks again. Uh, we, we've done it quite... Or the river, or, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I remember my daughter, when, when she was three or four, was just puzzled and said, how do you move a river? Uh, <laughs> and I'm not quite sure how you do, but... Um, but uh, we'll see in a, in a minute. Um, well, this, this gives you a, a better sense. This is, these are two images from the, er, from the 1870s. I think this is an 1871 photograph. Um, this is an 1877 newspaper engraving. This is the crowd greeting the procession when President Hayes came to visit Providence uh, in the spring or summer of 1877. Um, and it, it always makes me a little skeptical of of engravings because it's showing City Hall complete. And City Hall wasn't completed until the following year. Now maybe it was roughed out and there was enough of it there um, at the time. But you do, this, this image at least gives you a good sense uh, of this kind of space, that un very tight space really, that Union Station enclosed on the north, that same building line to the south and then um, City Hall uh, to the west. This, um, it's, it's, I, I don't know the function of it. It's part of the Union Station complex. Uh, this complex, as you can see, had, had a, basically the passenger waiting room was in the central building. There were freight offices. There were, um, I don't know what all goes, went into uh, this, but this, to the, the, the program of the building. Uh, but this was basically the public space and these were business spaces. But this, this, this 
a, a wing like this extended to the, the west as well. And there were these round buildings that terminated this, this building, which was, you know, several hundred, I don't know, four or five hundred feet long from one end to the other. Um, well, if you, if you just look at this, you can, you can see that, you know, here's, here's the south side of what we know as Kennedy Plaza today, uh, from Exchange Street here to Dorrance Street here. And you can see that that building is, is pretty much occupying a good bit of that length. So this is a, a several hundred foot long building. You didn't say those after the day. I mean, the, 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 the 1890s one, yes, up the hill. Uh, does the same thing. Uh, this is a, a bird's eye view uh, from 1882. Um, I've always marveled at these, and they exist for most um, cities of, of this size and scale in Providence in the 19th century. And it just amazes me uh, to figure out how somebody could figure out how to draw this. It's just something I, I, I really marvel at because other than a balloon, and I don't think a balloon could get you up, I don't know if you'd get up that high in a balloon, and, I don't, and certainly you could not, um, at least with the photography that I'm familiar with in 1882, you couldn't get panoramic views like that. So um, uh, I marvel at these bird's eye views that, uh, uh, are, are, are created out of somebody's imagination and, and yet seem to give us a good sense, if not in great, if not in specific detail, they certainly give us a good sense of, of the density of the, the built fabric. You can see here the Brown University campus over here with the open space here. But you get a sense of how dense um, uh, the city was spreading to the south and to the west, going out to Olneyville this way. Uh, and, did they both uh, have, go out to the harbor? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, the, the outlet, I mean, the there, was, there was an outlet that, that was what is today's Providence River. I mean, the, the wa yeah. water flowed through. Um, wait. Yeah, I keep thinking that it's being sort of stagnant. No, water flowed in from the west on the, the Wenasquatucket and from the north on the, the uh, Meshasset, uh, but it emptied into uh, the Providence River, and you can there are images that show that river um, flowing south. So uh, it 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 you know you might think it was stagnant, but no water water did move through it. Just just as water moves through Water Place Park. I mean, you look at it, it doesn't look like much is flowing through there, but but water is indeed um, flowing through Water Place water Park. Into it from the bay as well. It was a water. It was, it was, it was an estuary, so water was flowing up through the river into oh, the coast. Yeah. yeah. It was actually sort of where the salt water met the fresh water. Fresh water coming in from north and west and, and salt water with tides going in from, uh, um, from the south. There's a, in this, I'm sorry, back no, that. No. There's a very marked uh, thoroughfare that goes across the screen below the cove, south of the cove, all the way into the west. No, oh, not that yes. one. Lower. Sure. So, yeah, that, this that is Westminster one. Street. Westminster. Yeah, this is Westminster oh, Street right here. Westminster. Yeah, uh, going all the way out to Olneyville. Yeah. yeah. It's actually, that's north of Brown Campus, isn't it? If you follow it to the east, it goes north of Brown Campus. Well, this would be then um, Waterman Street. Yeah. Waterman Street coming out here and, and Angel Street here. Okay. And then this, oops. This is South Main and extending up uh, to North Main. Um, the artists tend to uh, exaggerate based on what the streets like really was like. Yeah. And this is Way Bossett and, and uh, Broad Streets um, heading out to the south and west. Um, this is one of the, the major um, building projects from the 1850s. Um, this is the uh, U.S. Custom House built between 1855 and 1857, still standing uh, on Waybossett Street, designed by Emmy Burnham Young, who was the supervising architect for the Department of the Treasury 
Um, and uh, he designed many of the custom houses from, um, <clears throat> from <clears throat> as far northeast as Portland and as far southwest as Galveston, Texas. So that he has a number of custom houses that, that are located uh, on the waterfront uh, along the, the east coast and, the, and the, the, the Gulf of Mexico. I don't think, I think Galveston is the farthest one west. Um, most of them built about this period. Uh, most of them, uh, like this, built of stone. Um, and of course, because this was the federal building, it, it, we, we call it the Custom House now because it, it, it eventually became the Custom House as the federal government grew and grew, and we'll see later federal buildings uh, next time. But this, this was the whole federal building, so everything, the post office, the Custom House, uh, any federal offices were in there. And because it was a federal building, it was built of stone, um, and it was built to be very secure. Uh, and all of these windows had very heavy, in fact, some of the st are still in place, very heavy iron shutters on the inside of the building. This, this building was built to be fortified, if need be. Um, and that was typical of, of federal buildings um, in the mid-years of the 19th century. This is the, I'll, we'll see it in just a minute. This is the Bank of North America, right here. This is the uh, um, Wilcox and um, uh, Equitable Building. Will, um, yeah, the Wilcox and Equitable Building. Um, Wilcox actually is an L-shaped building that wraps around um, the equitable building. But you see here, this is, is before those were built. This is, you know, the 1850s. So we, we have here um, the Bank of, of, of North America, uh, which you see here. But these buildings uh, are from the 1870s, this, this masonry building. Um, and then the, the equitable building, uh, built in 1874 for the Equitable Insurance Company. Uh, and this is a masonry building with a cast iron facade. Um, this is one of the few remaining buildings in Providence with a complete um, cast iron facade. Um, and this really, this presents, um, and, and with, uh, just to the, just to the uh, east of it, with the Custom House, uh, a wonderful little slice of, of commercial architecture from the third quarter of the, of, of the 19th century. Uh, a, a wonderfully intact, um, group of buildings that sort of chronicle the, the evolution from uh, this, this brownstone Italianate mode here through the high Victorian Gothic um, uh, of the Wilcox building with, with its, its polychrome uh, trim with, with uh, brick and uh, light colored stone and then the wonderful cast iron facade of, of the equitable building. Um, there, there's a lot of institutional growth going on in this particular period in Providence. Um, and uh, one of the major ones uh, from 1865 to 1868 uh, is Rhode Island Hospital uh, on, on Eddy Street. Uh, the building is, is, is long since gone, replaced uh, by later buildings. But this is the, uh, uh, the sort of high Victorian Gothic um, uh, building that uh, designed by Alpheus Morse, who was responsible for many major projects. We'll see some more of Morse's work in a in a uh, in a in a moment. Is the section that's going to be destroyed there? No, no. This has been gone for a long time. Um, uh, that that campus has been replaced and replaced and replaced over the course of time. I don't know what the oldest building there is today, probably 1890s. I'm, I'm not absolutely certain. Well, they've yeah. had one that's been vacant for a long time and deteriorating. Yeah. Still there, yeah. I think Frank, 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 Yeah, I, I just, I, I don't know off the, off the top of my head. But this, this was long since replaced um, uh, by other buildings. Yes. 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 Um, uh, manufacturing. Well, starting in 
Um, well, going back to, to Slaver Mill, um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit later about industry and providence, but the, the, the economics of it and the, the, the whole business set, uh, set up was that providence was basically the, the, the financial and legal and organizational center for a rapidly expanding hinterland. Uh, with 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 a number of rivers, the Patuxet, the Blackstone, the Mashasic, the Wenaspatucket, that all converged into Providence. Uh, you had a series of mills built on water privileges, when particularly early on, when water was what was being used uh, for power. Because we because we got into textiles uh, early on, we were using water both for for manufact for for power at first, uh, and then for processing. Uh, which is why we have such polluted rivers today, is that uh, all of these rivers were not only gave, fed water into these plants, but also served as a way to remove the waste um, from them. So uh, the, 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 the model here is uh, the banks, the insurance companies, the law firms, the brokers, both brokers of money and brokers of goods were all located in Providence. All of the manufacturing was taking place out on the rivers. Um, and it was really, uh, uh, industry didn't really come to Providence until much later uh, in the 19th century because by the time the rivers got to Providence, um, uh, they just didn't have any power. You know, they were flowing through, but they just didn't have the power to, uh, to uh, uh, drive the manufacturing that they did farther out. Um, so that the, the, the model here is, is all of the organization takes place in the center city, which makes sense because all of these folks need to talk to one another. The bankers and the brokers and the lawyers and the uh, uh, heads of companies all need to be in constant contact. And when you don't even have a telephone uh, to use, you know, proximity is very important. So that's, that's what makes everybody locate in the center uh, of the city. The manufacturing takes place out where the power is coming from, but things are located in a concentrated area because, because you really need to have the communication. Um, uh, a great deal of uh, civic building in the, um, uh, in the 19th century. Uh, these are uh, two school buildings uh, from the 1870s, both designed by Clifton Hall. The one in the upper right, upper left, um, is the Point Street School, which stood on Point Street um, beginning around 1874 or so. Um, I'm not sure exactly where on Point Street it was, but uh, it was built. Um, this, this other uh, building is, is a design that, that uh, Clifton Hall did. We don't know whether it was built, um, uh, but these are both uh, very typical 1870s schools, uh, dominated by a large you know, central entrance pavilion with a, with a, a tower, a bell tower, uh, for ringing the school bells. Um, actually, this, this one, I think this may too, have well, this seems to have three entrances. Uh, this, this has two, uh, typical of smaller schools, and often one for girls, one for boys, um, bec because classes were often segregated by sex uh, in the mid-years of the 19th century, even in, in, uh, in public schools. Um, but these, these, these pre present um, a, a real image, and I'm kind of working up to where this is coming from, uh, of, of civic architecture. Um, in the United States in the period from the 1860s through the 1880s. Is that a hall is Martin Hall or is that a different hall? It's a different hall. Um, and I don't think they're, I think they're actually not even related. Um, Clifton, uh, the one at Martin Hall is George F. Hall. So different, different halls entirely. Um, but the, 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 the preeminent expression of, of, of civic ambition uh, in Providence in, the, in, in these years is Providence City Hall, uh, designed by Samuel Thayer of Boston um, and built in the, the Second Empire uh, style. It's interesting that for a civic building, uh, the city decided to go outside of Providence to get an architect, so they hired a Boston architect 
who was well versed in, in building uh, in this um, very elaborate and impressive uh, mode based on the uh, uh, Second Empire. I'll get to that more in a minute. Providence talked about doing a city hall for quite some time. Thomas Teft designed a building for city hall in the 1850s, it's around 1853. Uh, it's interesting that where the city hall is today at the end of Kennedy Plaza is on a parcel that was known as the city hall lot. Uh, the city actually bought this parcel of land in the 1840s um, and didn't quite get, I mean, they, they, they um, they entertained ideas like this of Tefts from 1853, um, this, this, this wonderful sort of Italianate building uh, with a, a great dome on the top of it. They didn't get around to building anything. In fact, the, the, um, the city finally gave up on building anything for a while, uh, and they leased the land, and for about 20 years, uh, where today's City Hall is, was the site of the City Hall Theater. Um, it's one of the interesting cases that I know of, or one of the few that I know of, where a building is named for the building that will replace it, rather than, you know, you know, we used to have the Hoppin Homestead building downtown because it was built on the site of the Hoppin family's homestead, and there are other buildings that are named after what used to be there, but the City Hall Theater was named for what was going to replace it um, in an uh, odd uh, twist. Uh, but in the, in, the, in the 1870s, the city got serious about it and, and had a competition. Um, th we know that there were about eight entries, um, different architects submitting plans. Uh, I think we know of two of them. Um, they, weren't, uh, they weren't really published at the time, but in the 1870s, um, printing technology was, was not such that there were a lot of illustrations in magazines or newspapers. Um, uh, it was an expensive process to do, so you really don't see it very often. Um, but there were, um, there were competition drawings submitted by about eight people, uh, and they were exhibited, the records in the newspapers that they're being exhibited. Um, and this is the one that Thayer submitted, uh, a, a far more ambitious uh, building than, than actually what got built, uh, as you can see when you compare it here. You can see that, I mean, obviously this, this was, um, you know, you're probably putting as much money into this superstructure up here as you're putting into the rest of the building. So when, when the budget has to be cut, it's things like this that go. Um, I, I, I copied this, um, this image from an exhi uh, exhibition catalog uh, that was held about 30 years ago, Buildings on Paper. It was a, uh, an exhibit of Rhode Island architectural drawings. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm pleased to say that this drawing, which is in City Hall, uh, was restored um, uh, after the catalog was produced. And, and so um, uh, all of these watermarks have now been removed and uh, the, the drawing looks much better today. But this was um, the image I had. I didn't have to, time to go down to City Hall and track down where it is uh, right today. Um, but this gives you, a, gives you some sense of the, the um, efforts that the city was going through uh, to, to build a city hall and build an important um, uh, city hall. Uh, it's built uh, in the style of the Second Empire. Uh, this is the 1860 building at the Louvre in Paris. Uh, this was uh, the, the Louvre was vastly expanded in the 1850s and 1860s uh, in this Second Empire mode, and it became a highly influential building, as you can see here, just comparing the central pavilion of the Louvre here with the central pavilion at, at City Hall. And of course, Boston City Hall from just a couple of years earlier uh, is also in this mode, and other cities who were building City Halls were, were looking to the example of this um, vast, uh, civic improvement project that was going on under Napoleon III in Paris. Uh, has yeah. City Hall ever been built? I think, it's 60, I think it's 62 to 64. I think it's a, a, so, already, so we saw that as an example. That, that was an example, Oliver. That would have been in their mind yeah. to, 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 as, as something they're to imitate. Similar. They're, they're very similar. I, um, Providence's is actually a little bit more imposing. It's slightly bigger, um, uh, which, which uh, strikes me as, as typical of the sort of ambition that you get 
um, in provincial centers like Providence, you know. Well, Boston's got one, we'll build one even bigger and, 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 and more elaborate. Um, it was, um, uh, the, the, the building actually was, in, uh, was uh, planned to be demolished in the 1950s. Um, it was a, a, an ambitious plan done, two ambitious plans, I'll get to this next time, but two big ambitious plans done in Providence in the 1950s. One was the College Hill study, which proposed saving all of College Hill. The other was called Downtown Providence 1970, which included tearing down most of downtown Providence, <laughs> uh, including City Hall, to be replaced with something called a Tower of Light. Um, but fortunately, the, the city ran out of, of um, money or whatever, uh, and, and the, the building has been saved. If they built a big tower, it would definitely have been torn down. Yeah. Um, and then we, um, there are other uh, uh, institutional buildings from this period as well. This is Robinson Hall. Uh, this is um, uh, the, uh, the drawing for it uh, from 1874 by William Walker. Uh, this is at the corner of uh, Prospect and uh, Waterman Streets, uh, a red brick building which looks pretty much today as it does there. Uh, you don't get the, the richness of, of the texture of the, 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 the red brick and the white stone trim uh, in this drawing, but still it's, it's a nice drawing to, uh, um, I, I like to use drawings whenever I can, can use them. Um, this is the, uh, the Brown L building, which was on Westminster Street uh, in downtown Providence. Uh, another um, sort of tentatively uh, high Victorian Gothic building, uh, high Victorian in the sense that it has pointed arches over the windows um, and a steep roof to it. Um, but um, this is what so often you see in commercial buildings in the 19th century, where the format really doesn't change very much. And indeed, you look at commercial buildings built, being built today, uh, there are storefronts on the lower stories and then um, offices. Um, and so forth on, on the upper stories. And the, the format is largely the same. What changes is, what, how do you dress it up? What style do you dress it up in? Uh, here in the 1870s, um, um, James Buckland, um, later in his career, chose to do this in, in a Gothic mode. Um, we begin to see um, industry coming to Providence uh, in the later years of the 19th century. Um, and that largely is a, um, a byproduct of the spread of steam manufacturing. As I was saying earlier, the, the uh, 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 Wenasquatucket doesn't flow very rapidly here. And you can see that it is certainly not being used at all for water power. And, this, uh, and you can see by the number of smokestacks. Uh, this is Brown and Sharp, the corner promenade. This is Holden Street. This building uh, right here is the only thing that's not there anymore. It's interesting to me that they call this whole complex the foundry because the one, thing that's, the one building that's missing from the whole complex <laughs> is the foundry itself, which is this building, uh, now a parking lot. Uh, so it's kind of like you know, being named for something that's going to replace you, uh, um, like the City Hall um, um, Theater. Um, uh, but this, this largely intact, uh, and, and a con this be begun on the site uh, in 1870. Brown and Sharp goes back uh, as a machine tool uh, company, goes back to the early 1830s, um, but uh, really began to take off in the 1870s, uh, starting in this building and then spreading up the hill, uh, both to the north and to the northwest. Uh, as well as west along the river, uh, becoming the large complex it is today. Um, and again, a, a, a steam-powered uh, mill, um, as was just down the river and still there, uh, the Nicholson File Complex uh, from 1864, uh, which began in this little build, these two little buildings right here, and then, uh, like Brown and Sharp, expanded as as the the uh, uh, the company. Uh, became more and more successful and, and began, began uh, manufacturing more and more um, uh, products. Um, yes? Can you speak a little bit about, um, what, was that vacant land before these industrial use 
pieces were put there. Um, I, I know you mentioned earlier that um, the Durham City portion of Providence had been mostly residential before um, commercial, this commercial architecture was put in and now these industrial use. I'm just wondering if this would be straight up land? This was. I would I would best characterize it as as uh, underutilized land. Um, there were some some small scale houses scattered around here, and I think the same was true at uh, um, um, at Nicholson File. Uh, but this and as you again with, with engravings and things that are drawn, not photographed. There's always artistic license. But you can see here, what's being shown is a lot of vacant land. Uh, to the, this is the, the, the uh, Wenasquatucket River. Vacant land to the west, vacant land to the north. And I think that land was pretty much um, undeveloped. Um, I know from uh, work I did when I surveyed the, the Smith Hill area um, in, 40 years ago, uh, that th th most of the buildings that you see there today are probably the first ones on the land, at least in any, in any significant number. There may, may have been a house here or a house there, but uh, this was largely undeveloped land to the west. Yes? They, they must have walled, the, the river must have been, it must have been sort of a big floodplain. Yeah. yeah. So the river must have been contained to the great improved the well, I, it, it was, and I, I think probably, probably what drove that more than anything else was the coming of the railroad. Because the, the, the rail lines through Providence, um, I mean, the, the station has been moved back and back and back. We saw you know, how it used to be on the south side of the cove. Um, but, but basically, the rail alignment coming up from the south, coming in along the river, to the south side of the cove and then going up along the Mashasic River. That rail alignment has pretty much been there since the, the, the railroad came through in, 18, in the 1840s. There were, there, were, there were trains that came here in the 1830s, but the early trains kind of um, went south of downtown Providence to a terminal station that was near where Rhode Island Hospital is today. Um, and then it, it, and there was uh, uh, another line that went up to Boston, but if you took the train from New York to Boston in 1840, <clears throat> you took the train to Providence, got off, the, got off the, um, the, the, in the Providence Station on the west side of the Providence River, took a ferry across the Providence River, got on another train, and went on up to Boston because there wasn't a rail line that went up. That was one of the reasons for moving that rail line up to the south side of the cove, is to have a, have a continuous rail line that would go through the city and, con and, and take you right into the heart of downtown, which is always, in the 19th century, where you want your rail line to go, is right into downtown. Um, so I think, um, <clears throat> I think it's the coming of the railroad uh, that, that really made improvements start to happen uh, along, along the Wenasquatucket River. And of course, the presence of a rail line near a river makes it really convenient too for manufacturing because that's the one thing a manufacturer wants uh, is direct rail access. Uh, and if you look at where spur lines exist throughout Rhode Island, they're basically going out to uh, manufacturing centers al along the rivers. <coughs> Likely that some of the fill of that marsh might have come from the edge of Federal Hill. You could fill that top there. Yeah. yeah. So they could have carved that out and fill up to the river's edge uh, to make that sort of buildable property there. There's, there was a lot more of that going on than we realize. If you, I, I've seen images of, uh, of Smith Hill for in the early 19th century, drawings admittedly, but basically where the State House lawn is today, and that was a bluff. That, and that, that, that had to go somewhere too. So it probably came from the north as, as well as the south to fill in the, along the sides of the river to, to make the rail lines come through, and then it makes it much more attractive for, for manufacturing. And of course, as steam power comes in, that, that becomes a desirable place to build. So that's, you know, one of the, all of these things, one builds on another. Yeah, Clark. The Corliss, the big Corliss machines, were they made at Corliss Landing, or were they made, where, where did they make the steam engines for Corliss? Um, 
I'm trying to remember where. Oh, over, over, over West River. Yeah. yeah. Well, there was there was a big Corliss plant out in what's now the Rest River Industrial Park near the main post office. Uh, yeah, that's that's where Corliss's main um, uh, plant was in the in the 19th century. Uh, and again, that's because that's on water as well. And they also started in the 18th, late 60s, I imagine, also in Yeah, yeah. Now we'll, we'll switch to um, uh, domestic uh, architecture here and, and talk a little bit about houses that were built here. Um, I, I used the image at the, the upper left, that's the uh, Tully Bowen House that we saw before, designed by Thomas Taft, built in 1853. Um, and I used it just because uh, of its format. It's basically a cube. It has a center entrance with windows on either side, three windows across the second floor, three across the third. Um, so, so much of what happens, uh, at least for most building in Providence, it seems to me, in the 19th century, um, it, it's the same thing that you're doing with commercial buildings, you're doing with houses. Format here is pretty much the same as the Drown House on Benefit Street from 1862. Um, but here, the inspiration is coming from the Second Empire in France. So we're looking, uh, the architect uh, was certainly looking at what was going on in Paris, taking a format that was pretty standard in Providence uh, and dressing it up with a mansard roof uh, and with uh, very highly inflected wall surfaces that move in and out with, with, with columns, uh, columns here with coins here, but you know a recessed central pavilion. You can see it here in the roof as well as um, in the main block of the house, and very animated detail with string courses uh, between the stories, uh, pediments over the second story windows, little balconies at the second story level, uh, a very elaborate staircase that goes up uh, from either side. Um, but when you, when you look at the basic form of the building, you're seeing something here that's not all that, that radical. It is just, it's just being dressed up in a new guise um, uh, here. Um, here's the same house, and there there are many of these that are translated into smaller versions. Um, this is this is one of my favorite uh, little mansard roofed houses in Providence. This is the Charles Dowler House um, from around 1874. Uh, it's at the corner of uh, Smith Street and Oakland Avenue, um, heading out Route 44. It's an absolutely charming little house. Uh, Dowler was a painter, and at least. I, I, was, I was in it maybe 40 years ago, and he had done ceiling paintings in the house, and they were there 40 years ago. I, I hope they're still there today. Um, but it's, it, is, it is one of the most, uh, to my mind, dressed up of these little mansard-roofed houses, probably because Dowler was a painter, was artistic, and wanted something that was a little bit more artistic expression. Not a, a, a large house, not particularly imposing, but it has a certain, it has a real presence on the street. Um, it, it achieves some monumentality despite its rather small size, I think. What sort of roof, how would you describe that roof? You know, there's like a double hit on mansard. You know. <laughs> yeah, well, man, mansard, mansard roofs come in variety. Right. And, and, and some of them, um, uh, like this one, are basically a two sloped roof. Um, yeah, it's like a double yeah. uh, you know, this, this probably has another slope that you can't see quite so uh, easily. This just happens to be higher, and this actually has a deck on top of it. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a mansard, it's a deck on mansard roof, if you will, <laughs> with a double slope mansard. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, it, it certainly g gives the building some uh, um, uh, importance. I mean, it, it's, you know, the, 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 the roof is almost as important as the rest of the building when you start looking at it and analyzing it compositionally. Um, a lot of uh, uh, what I characterize as modern Gothic houses 
uh, in Providence in the 1860s and 1870s. Uh, this is just a smattering from, uh, from um, these are on Broadway up here. This is on Parade Street um, in uh, uh, the West End, and this, of course, on Benefit Street. This is 103 Parade, which just coincidentally was the um, the first project of the Providence Preservation Society Revolving Fund when it got started in the 1970s. This was the uh, very first, I want to say 77 or so, is that 78, something like that. Um, but all of these characterized by, by this, this stick work, uh, which, which led um, Vincent Scully 60 years ago to, 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 to label it the, the stick style because there's so many, there's so much uh, articulation of corners and uh, baseboards and uh, sills and so forth throughout all of these. Um, but the source really is, is, is Gothic cottages. And these were, in fact, when you read about them in, in architectural magazines or you read about them in the Providence Journal, they'll be described as modern Gothic um, uh, because they, 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 they tend to have very uh, uh, vertical roofs with, with very pointed dormers uh, and a lot of this articulated uh, uh, stick work uh, all over the house. Um, and then we have here two, um, two Queen Anne houses, or two, uh, uh, three of them actually, uh, two which are, are among my favorites. These are um, houses on, uh, on Parade Street, uh, designed by uh, Edward I. Nickerson, uh, and built for b two business partners uh, who built them at exactly the same time in 1881. Um, and it's one of the things that I think makes, is, is so, interesting about them is that they were same architect for two families who were friends, uh, who were in business together, um, and um, decided to build houses at the same time using the same architect. And what, what I find really fascinating about that um, here is the way Nickerson has juxtaposed forms uh, from one house to the other. They, they're not mirror images. Um, you know, you get, you get this, this emphatic triangle. Here, uh, there's something of it there, but then you get this wonderful roof that slopes down around it here. Um, these, these buildings really compositionally play off one another uh, so absolutely beautifully. And um, uh, those are on Parade Street. There's 77 and 81 Parade Street, right, right across from the Cranston Street Armory. Um, my, you know, when I took that picture, my back was to the Cranston Street Armory. Um, uh, and they're, of course, they're, they're highly visible because of the parade there, uh, as are all the houses on uh, both Parade Street and Dexter Street um, uh, on the east side of the parade. Um, and then another um, Queen Anne house on the east side. Uh, these are... It's interesting here how not only is there a variation in, in juxtaposition of forms in here, but there's a juxtaposition of articulation and of materials where this uses clabbered on the first story, shingle on the second story, which is, is true um, in this house as well. Here we get the other variation you see so often in Providence, which is masonry on the first story uh, and shingle on the upper story. Um, and just to make sure that you get as much variety as possible, uh, you get a brick foundation, you get a stone, different brick on the lower part of the first story, stone trim uh, around the entrance and below the windows, and then another color brick above it. So, um, and then there's, there's slate. Um, this may be asphalt. Now, I imagine it was slate originally. So, you know, you, you had a, a variety of brick, clabbered, shingle, slate, um, uh, brownstone. Uh, so there's, there's, there is no lack of, of variety in building materials uh, in these houses. Um, and then I think one of the most, um, some of the most vigorous architecture in Providence, to my eye, um, is this sort of colonial revival inspired Queen Anne houses, so uh, <laughs> is the best way to put it. Because you know what these are all looking at 
is this double slope gamble roof that you see in the Joseph Jenks house at the corner of Jenks and Benefit Street from 1774. But here, here it is again, here it is here, here it is here. Of course, what they did with Queen Anne houses is, you know, let's just really make something out of it. So let's make it a two-story um, uh, uh, double slope roof. And let's articulate it as much as possible with bay windows, with, with corner towers coming off of it, bay windows here. Um, uh, it, it's, it, it's, uh, but it, it's really taking this um, colonial form uh, and playing around with it, with bay windows, with a recessed window here, um, lots of, of, of uh, garlanded trim on this corner tower. Um, uh, very, very highly articulated, but, but the, the, the basic, you know, element here is this, this double slope gamble roof um, that here, you know, just covers the attic story, but in, in the 1880s and 1890s uh, becomes, uh, takes on a life of its own. Um, and, and like the Dowler House with that elaborate mansard roof, um, uh, these really uh, almost dominate the house, this, this, this large um, gamble roof. Where's that one in the upper right? This is on Hope Street. Okay. Hope and, I think it's Hope and George. Do we know her? Do we know her? I think it's Stone Carpenter and Wilson. Stone Carpenter and Wilson. The yeah, the segment arch over the doorway. Um, yeah. That's Stone Carpenter and Wilson. I'm pretty sure that both of these are um, Gould, Angel, and Swift, or Angel and Swift. One permutation of that form, Gould, Angel, and Swift really kind of made this two-story um, gamble roof, highly articulated house, sort of their stock and trade. So um, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that both of these are, are by that firm. Um, and then, you know, just a little bit of everything. Um, uh, you know, this is, is, this is, a, a, this is a what style is it conundrum. Um, because it, it looked as though they, they looked at everything around them and took one from each. It, it, you know, it, 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 it's, um, um, and at some point Stone and Carpenter was involved in this, although it looks nothing like anything else I know of Stone and Carpenter. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I've, I've come to realize that, you know, when, when you see an odd building or a strange building or even a bad building, don't necessarily blame the architect. You know, the person who paid for it got what they wanted. And I think that, that uh, uh, Gerothmo Barnaby, who was uh, a highly successful merchant uh, with a big store downtown, uh, just wanted a little bit of everything. Um, and, and I think this is not, and I'm pretty sure this is not a, a single building campaign. I, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I, I don't know it, but my guess is that this tower came later. Just, there's just something odd about the way this, it intersects with this here. And, and e even this, this gabled end, you know, it does sort of relate to the mansard on the front, but it, 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 it's working off of it, but it, it's, there's just something that's, there's, there's nothing that's of a piece about this house. Uh, this is on, uh, yeah, it's on Broadway. Um, uh, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's hard to miss it. it, it, is, it is, <laughs> I mean, Broadway has some elaborate houses, but this, this is by far the most schizophrenic of any of the buildings uh, on, on, on Broadway, which has probably the biggest collection of the more exuberant late 19th century um, houses of any place in Providence. Um, and uh, you know what? What research I've done into it. Um, uh, my, my conclusion is that the people who were building houses on Broadway 
uh, were first generation with a lot of money, recently made, mostly in, in, uh, in uh, merchandising, in retail, maybe some manufacturing, but I think it's, it's largely um, commercial investment. But uh, this is, um, it certainly reads as, and my research shows it is largely um, pretty much new money uh, on Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we, if you want to welcome him here, that's, uh, I, I don't. Uh, and I wanted, what I wanted to talk about too, because it, it just fills um, this, so much of the city of Providence, and I'm, I'm struck by it uh, driving through. You know, you, you drive down Broadway and you see one-off after one-off after one-off house, and you see that on Stimson Avenue. You see it driving out Waterman or in on Angel Street, on uh, a lot of buildings, uh, streets that developed at this time. But so much of Providence uh, has so many houses that are alike. And this, this house, this is the Milo Mason house, or actually it's the Marie Mason house. Uh, the, the marker says Milo Mason, but Marie actually owned the house. Uh, it was in her name, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm one who believes very strongly that, that, that uh, whoever owned the house, whose name it was in, is what the, the marker can say. But this is Marie Mason's house. She and her husband Milo lived here. Built it around 1840 or so. Uh, this is 112 Benefit Street uh, at the, the corner of uh, Bowen. Uh, Bowen going down here, Benefit here. Uh, this is this is the typical Greek Revival house in Providence. It's, it's three bays wide with a side hall with a door to one side, which means there's a side hall plan, there's a staircase going up here. Oops. And you can actually read that on the building because that's the reason there are no windows here because the staircase goes right up here. Um, but um, it's, it's turned narrow into the street and it's made as, as sort of Greek as we can get it by slapping on some corner pilasters to sort of look like columns and, and a pediment uh, over the, the gable end roof. And then you repeat that motif around the door uh, and there you have instant Greek revival. Uh, but it's this form uh, that just filled the city of Providence uh, in the late 19th century. And I just show you a few of them. Here's the house on Benefit Street. Um, this is a house on, I think it's on uh, um, Increment or uh, Mansfield Streets in Smith Hill. Uh, this is also in Smith Hill. But you can see here this basic formula side hall plan um, with a staircase going up here. Uh, to make it a little bit more stylish in the late 19th century, instead of having two windows, you put a bay window on it in front. Uh, and then you dress it up with some with a hood over the front door, both instances here, uh, with brackets on it, brackets on the bay window, brackets on the corners, um, and then dress it up with some roundhead windows uh, in the attic story. Uh, but this is a formula. Um, I don't, I can't tell if this is. No, there are two meters there, so that probably is a two-family as well. Most of these were two-family. You do see some that are, that are single-family. But this became a standard uh, two-family house. And drive through Smith Hill or Federal Hill uh, or even northern places in Elmwood, you'll just find block after block after block of these. Uh, and it's one of the things that really kind of defines these neighborhoods um, and I think gives them such a wonderful uh, visual uh, coherence. Uh, this is, is, is uh, Mansfield Street on, uh, on Smith Hill, uh, as it looked this morning, actually. Um, <laughs> and this is on Federal Hill. Uh, here we have a, a slightly larger um, uh, multiple family house. But if you think about the houses we've looked at earlier, uh, this is basically taking um, a more or less center entrance house and stretching it out, stretching it up, uh, and making it into multiple family uh, use. But the, but the overall form of this house is really very little changed from things that were being built in the middle of the 18th century. Uh, and they just got expanded into multiple family housing uh, in the 19th century. And here's that two family house with the side hall plan usually with, as we see here and, and down the street, um, with a, an entrance porch for two entrances, one for the up, uh, unit on the first story, one for the unit on the second story, with turn posts, uh, and usually a bay window across the front. And again, we're still getting, even here in a modest 
uh, basically, a, this is a, a, a 19th century tract house is one way to think about this. But still, you know, a change in, in surface texture between the first and second story uh, to give it some visual um, uh, oomph uh, and a bracketed cornice as well. Um, and then I, I, the thing that's impressed me the most, this is, there's nothing else like it. Uh, in the city of Providence. Uh, these are the, the Andrew Dickout cottages uh, built by a man who was a German immigrant who did well here and got into real estate speculation and built these houses on Bath Street uh, in the spring and summer of 1883. Um, these are on Smith Hill uh, and there are 13 of them, all of them identical. Uh, there's, there's been a little bit of change, a couple of people have added porches to them. Um, but if you ever get a chance to drive down Bass Street, it's really an impressive sight to, to see this, this row of 13 identical houses that stretch you know, all the way from basically Orm Street down to Valley Street. Um, uh, quite an impressive row. Uh, very modest little houses. You know, same format we've seen, side hall plan uh, with two windows flanking the side door. Uh, but it's just the, the repetition of them that, that makes it uh, so impressive. Um, I was, it was a treat when I discovered these 40 years ago when I was doing the, the Smith Hill survey. Um, and we need to say a few things about, about churches um, in the late 19th century because this is the time when there are so many churches being built uh, in Providence. It's the time when uh, the city is filling up uh, with people first from, from Ireland in particular. Um, in the mid-years of the 19th century uh, and then toward the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century a lot of Italians uh, as well but but the Roman Catholic population in Providence just surges and there are uh, church after church after church um, uh, uh, this is is uh, James Murphy's uh, St. Mary's Church from 1864 uh, on Broadway this is at the very um, end of Broadway right before you get to Route 10 um, and quite an imposing church and even more visible because of the open space uh, of Route 10 and you see it, you know, coming, coming in from Olneyville. Um, uh, Murphy was, a, was uh, I think, born in Ireland, uh, came to this country and was prolific and, and specialized in Roman Catholic churches um, and did a booming business uh, for most of the late 19th century. Um, and then we have uh, here Charles Wilcox's uh, Congdon Street Baptist Church uh, in a, a sweet little drawing that Wilcox did before the, the building was built. Um, this still stands um, uh, on, on Congdon Street, looking pretty much as it did when, when this drawing was created. Um, a very simple little church with, with some uh, really winsome uh, 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 sort of Romanesque detail in the round arched window, tripartite window on the facade, the round arched windows uh, in the corner tower, and these round, this round uh, arched uh, louvered belfry. Uh, at the top of the tower. Um, and then um, perhaps the, one of the most imposing uh, of, of churches in Providence is, uh, and this is, this is sort of leading into where we'll be going next week when we get into more of the elaborate um, uh, architecture inspired by Paris's Ecole de Beaux-Arts, um, as, as both of these are, um, the, the uh, uh, Old Stone Bank, Providence Institution for Savings, as, as revised by Stone Carpenter and Wilson between 1896 and 98. And then, uh, I, I, I just, when I first came to Providence, I couldn't believe this was a congregational church. <laughs> uh, uh, this is, is, is by Carrera and Hastings. Uh, I'll be talking more about them and their, and their background and their contemporaries. But Carrera and Hastings were both graduates of the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris, so they knew classicizing architecture first, firsthand from studying it and seeing it, and built uh, what the Congregationalists you know, at the time said was Renaissance. Um, uh, it, uh, uh, it's, it's very late Renaissance, if it's Renaissance at all. Uh, to my, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful building. and. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not doing it justice by the black and white picture and not showing the interior. If you've never been inside it, go inside it. This is one of the most complete decorative arts um, complexes in the city. Um, it's, it's, it's a very arts and crafts, uh, American Renaissance 
um, detail uh, with, with wonderful tiles and glass um, and beautifully finished, largely as built. So what you're seeing is what was intended when it was completed uh, 120 years ago. <laughs> this, this is Central Congregational Church on Angel Street. What, what you, and this, this is, this is pre, this is pre-hurricane. So these towers are gone. I'm not sure if the cupola is still there, but I know the, the towers are gone from this, and this has been very much simplified. Uh, but this shows you what it was built, what it was intended, and what it, how it was built uh, when it was completed in the 1890s. So 38 hurricane took the towers off? I don't know whether it was 38 or 54. Um, I, I, I don't know, and you know, sometimes, with, with certain things, it was a cumulative effect. I don't know, you know, like the, the towers on uh, what's now Mem Hall at RISD. I don't know whether that was 38 or 54 that took them off, but given, given 38 and 54 in close succession, it could have been damaged from both and after 54. Hmm? Oh, well, that's, yeah, that's, well, 40, that would just compound the, 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 the felony. Oh, and Memorial Hall was the old central congregation. That was the old, yeah, that was the old central. So, and this was built when? Uh, 93, 1893. And so at that point, did they just build this and move the congregation? They, and they just moved, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I was always kind of puzzled why Central Congregational Church was on the east side of Providence. Mm -hmm. But it was actually located much closer to downtown. And it was, I think, well, I don't, you know, you, I don't know the whole history of churches in Providence, but you know, there, there weren't that many congregational churches um, at that time. So I am going to end there and just give you a teaser of what we'll be getting into next week when we go from 1890 to 1940, um, because um, the, the, the significant buildings come even more fast and furious, uh, because we're talking about probably the time when Providence was by, was one of the richest, Rhode Island was the richest state per capita in the country uh, during this next time period, 1890 to 1940. So we'll see wonderful colonial revival houses, wonderful churches like St. Anne's Church, um, the uh, original, uh, uh, or not original, with the Providence Journal building uh, from 1906, and of course the Rhode Island State House. And I'll talk more about these when we get to them next week, but this is just to kind of give you an idea of what comes and what, how rich things really get next time. Thank you.